We're back. We're live at 12 o'clock rock on a given Monday. This is a big day for Mina, Marco, and me. This is a big day for energy. This is a moment of history. Uh, it's energy history being made even as we speak. Some people like the decision of the P PUC. Uh, others do not like it at all. Um, one of the national news organizations found over the weekend that Hawaii was the 49th state uh, in terms of being friendly to business, 49. And what happened with Nextera Energy Hawaii is a, is a part of that somehow. So we have lots to go before we sleep. Uh, Mina, Marco, and me, we're going to discuss what happened here and what it means. Uh, welcome to the show, you guys. Mina, Marco, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Jay. And as, as Dorothy said when she arrived in Munchkin land, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. So whether we're, whether we're over the rainbow or not yet, Jay and Mina, remains to be seen, but we're sure as heck not in Kansas anymore. Well, as one person yeah. said when I told him that it was, we're 49 out of 50, he said, well, that we, still have, we still have one we're better than, <laughs> whoever that is. <laughs> what were you going to say, Mina? No, I, I, I just wanted to thank you guys for including me and um, having me back after a long uh, hiatus. <laughs> oh, you're part of our show. You're part of the title of our show, Mina. I have to keep we've, coming We've back. missed you. We've <laughs> missed you very much, Mina. It's great to have you back. So let's thank talk you. first about, um, about the appointment of uh, Tom Gorak. Uh, what happened there? I mean, the, the newspaper made me very nervous about the process that was uh, employed at the PUC for that appointment? Well, I, I'm, I'm going to be really careful here because I am the plaintiff. And, um, you know, I just want to say that the petition speaks for itself, that, you know, I am concerned about the process. And um, even though, um, you know, the merger decision is out, you know, I think that this is a legal question that needs to be resolved by the court. Uh, um, you know, and, and, and we'll have an effect on future appointments as well as this, this, this current one. You're referring to the lawsuit that you filed uh, immediately after uh, the court ruled on Friday, or rather the PUC ruled on, on Friday uh, to the effect that that merger would be um, um, rejected. Um, so that's the lawsuit we're talking about. In that lawsuit, uh, you are questioning whether Gorak's appointment is um, is appropriate and, and valid. And I guess you're right. as, you're asking what what court are you asking for a ruling? Um, it goes to First Circuit Court, and so I believe the judge assigned to it is Judge Nasino. Okay. So what's the next step that's going to happen in that case? Um. So this is um, in part um, a, a petition that goes to the court to um, ask Gorak the, the question on what legal authority he has uh, to take that office. Okay. So Gorak, as a respondent, has to answer to the court what gives him the legal right to take that office. I, I take it this is about the uh, the phrase in the in the statute that says he has to be appointed and qualified before he can replace the previous commissioner. Right. I mean, the question here is whether a vacancy was created, and. Um, um, I, the short answer is I don't believe our vacancy has been created because the statute is clear that the, um, the, the, the commissioner, the sitting commissioner whose term end, ended sits as a holdover until the successor is appointed and qualified. Um, the governor is arguing that the Constitution gives him the right to appoint when a vacancy is created. And I, you know, I agree with that. When a vacancy is created, the governor does have a right to appoint. But given the appointment process and um, an earlier section in the, in the Constitution, um, it, it looks like the, the drafters of the Constitution 
sort of anticipated this. Um, you know, a, a member's term ending and address that that by saying that the the um, the incumbent member sits until his successor is appointed and qualified to avoid a vacancy. Who's your lawyer, Mina? Oh, so my attorney is Mark Bennett, the former attorney general. Oh, I did see that. That's right. He used to be the attorney general of the state under Linda Lingle for two terms. He has plenty yeah. of experience in, um, in state attorney general issues. Marco, what do you yeah. think? What do you think about this? Well, I'm not qualified to, to get into the legal parts of it, Jay, not being an attorney. I mean, uh, this is one of these things that uh, you've got different attorneys that apparently are saying different things with the uh, state attorney general, Douglas Chin, who rendered his uh, opinion to the governor, who said uh, that uh, David E. Gay was within his rights to do what he did uh, in terms of uh, replacing Mike Champley with Tom Gorak. From a more kind of practical perspective, I hope that there is some type of uh, resolution to uh, Mina's suit sooner rather than later because one of the things I fear is that if this takes a while to get a court to issue some type of opinion or decision that that kind of freezes the commission to some extent or, or puts puts the cloud of illegitimacy on on commission votes or commission's decisions that, uh, that Tom Gorak uh, were to be a part of and as uh, pretty much everyone agrees, I mean, yes, the uh, the next era HEI attempted uh, acquisition uh, is now in the history books. Uh, that was the big docket, which was taking up so much of the oxygen in the room for so long. But there's a lot of other really important stuff out there in terms of open dockets before the Public Utilities Commission that we really uh, very much uh, need guidance and answers from them sooner rather than later. So the possibility of having one or more of these uh, possible decisions coming from the commission that somehow would be delegitimized by the cloud that's over over Gorak's appointment uh, is, is of a concern to me. Well, you know, it strikes me that, <clears throat> uh, that the governor moved very quickly on this. He could have let Champley stay. Um, but I think, you know, uh, although uh, they all deny it, I think there had to be some consideration of how Champley would have voted had he been able to vote. Um, and, and that's a very interesting question because um, arguably, and, and I, I say arguably because at the end, uh, Gorak did not, apparently he abstained, he did not actually vote on the decision. But what strikes me is this is an unusual appointment also in the sense that you have counsel for the PUC uh, who arguably was there, arguably saw at least some of the proceedings, arguably, you know, saw the paper, uh, and, and that deals with the, com you know, with the concern that <clears throat> this is a guy who hadn't been around, uh, and you, you're relieving a guy who has been around, and listen to all of, all of the testimony and the evidence, um, and replacing him with someone who doesn't. On the other hand, uh, he was there. Gorak was there. Uh, what I would throw into the hopper on this, though, is that Gorak was not there as commissioner. He might have been there as counsel. He might have been there as a staffer but he was not there as a commissioner. And it's different. If you've ever been in a position of judicial, judicial authority, as Mina has, you know that the, when the mantle is on you, you think a certain way. You listen to the evidence a certain way. You incorporate the whole process into your very being so you can make the right decision. And, and counsel or a staffer simply doesn't occupy that special fiduciary kind of role. So it doesn't really answer the question of, um, you know, was he there or not there? Uh, is he qualified to rule on something uh, because, simply because he was counsel? Uh, and that's just a factual matter. I don't know if that has any legal moment, but it, it strikes me that uh, that doesn't really answer the problem. And so what we have is uh, is decision ultimately, which was a, was it uh, a, an abstention? So you had both uh, Randy Iwasi, the chair, and the other commissioner, Lorraine Akiba, uh, voting against the merger. That was interesting because the press had indicated that if Champley remained, he would swing Akiba and they would vote against Iwase and they would, they would have accepted the merger. So some really strange stuff happened at the PUC 
uh, around the, the nomination of this third commissioner. Don't you think? Any reaction to that? Nina, you want to um, take, a, take a shot at that? Yeah, I, I mean, you just, you know, if um, Templey was still there, you have to wonder what the order would look like and, you know, what would be um, Akiba's position at that time. Um, yeah, at, at this point, it's really hard to speculate what would have come out. Yeah. Marco? Mm hmm well, I mean, I agree with you, Jay, that the, uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, hyper, uh, bloviating and hyperventilation about, uh, about you know, reading the tea leaves and who was going to vote in which direction and w where Mike was leaning before he, he left or before he, uh, he uh, departed from his office essentially on the 30th of, of June. But uh, to what degree there was uh, any fire behind uh, uh, that, that smoke that we were seeing or that we were thinking that we were seeing, you know, I, I, really, I really don't know. I was, uh, I was surprised uh, uh, about the decision in terms of, uh, as I was kind of gaming out the possibilities, I, would not have, I was not predicting two to zero with, with Gorak abstaining. So uh, just when you think you've, you've thought about all the reasonable possibilities to anticipate and lo and behold is is human nature you find something that whaps you between the eyes and oh i didn't even think of that how how interesting is that but uh you know substantively uh, i'll just add briefly and I, I've, I've read through the uh the decision in order which goes to on to 200 plus pages not including appendices and what's really kind of striking to me is uh, they, they cited a lot of uh, kind of specific data points but what i found most uh most interesting was the overall kind of subjective standard uh, that the commission cited here, and I'll just read briefly one sentence here. The commission finds and concludes that applicants have not sufficiently demonstrated by a preponderance of the evidence that the change of control would be, and here are the operative words, would be reasonable and in the public interest. Reasonable and in the public interest. So. Uh, I mean, it, inherently, I think uh, reasonable and, and public interest is subject to a, a fair amount of subjectivity. So th they tried to be, uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of meat in that, uh, in that DNO, the decision order, uh, as well. But I think uh, uh, where they really kind of caught my eye was uh, reasonable in the public interest and what that means uh, for the future. Uh, as far as this commission, a future commission is applying that type of criteria to other deals of this type of nature one day as they as I'm sure they're going to be yeah I mean I don't know what a reasonable means reasonable is a hard word legally and I didn't know that well, reasonable was the test here I thought it was in the public interest but reasonable no, uh, no, it's no. hard to take that up well, on appeal no but the, the, you know the reasonableness has to be fit, has to fit within the stand the typical standards and precedents that are used and you know it, it, those standards are fit willing and able and to do no harm you know so so i think you know um there's a lot of odd logic <laughs> um w w within this order and I, I i i it's really hard for me to call this a decision a decision would have been a straight up or down, I mean, an up or down vote based on the merits of the, of the application. You know, and, and it, would, it would have had strong findings of facts either way. You know, what you have is just a plain old dismissal and come back. Mm -hmm. And you see when you use a dismissal, it means that the application is flawed or incomplete or, but... <laughs> You know, I, it, it, well, Mina, is it, it, do you think the order is flawed? What's that? Do you think the order is flawed? Well, I think, I, I mean, I see it as a way around without getting a, a decision. You know, if they held Nextera to a high standard, that, that high standard would have set a precedent has been applicable to all other change in control um, applications. 
you know, electricity, um, uh, the water utility, um, any any change of control application. Yeah. So I think to get around this, they dismiss the application. So there's no precedent involved. Uh, no precedent, but I mean, really, uh, uh, could this be appealed? I mean, is the term reasonable supported or not? Is the term reasonable the right standard? I, I know about best interest of the public, but reasonable? That's, uh, that's a hard one to appeal from if you, if you give the commissioners any discretion at all. So it sounds well, like yeah, to me, I mean, just off the side, it sounds I, like to me is whatever they decided is very subjective, as Marco says. And it's totally subjective, reasonable, and it's really not yeah. capable of an appeal. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, again, to take stuff up to appeal, you know, there has to be a, they usually defer to the administrative agency, you know, there has to be some kind of procedural flaw to really get your foot in the door. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh -huh. so I, I wake up this morning, and lo and behold, now there's an article to the effect that Nextera and uh, Hawaiian Electric have uh, terminated their negotiations. It, that they treat this, uh, and, and that's driven by their own words, uh, by this decision. And they have separated uh, from their, you know, their respective roles. They are terminating negotiations, whatnot. And uh, here's the part that surprised me. Um, and that uh, next era was paying uh, uh, Hawaiian Electric $95 million. I, 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 thought, I thought this would not apply at this point in the game because there was a quasi-judicial rejection but I guess um, they, they were still obligated to pay that much. Do you know anything about it, Marco? Well, I think, uh, I mean, I've, I've read the merger agreement, Jay, and it's, it's, it's the type of merger agreement that I think you have to be a lawyer making five, six, seven hundred bucks an hour to figure it out. It's really, really thick. But regarding the termination fee, I think it's, uh, from my very layman's perspective, I think it is unambiguous that if NextEra is and uh, was and now is unsuccessful in essentially closing the deal in terms of getting regulatory approval that they are on the hook for 90 million termination fee plus a max five million dollars in expenses which i got to believe hei hit quite a while ago so i think uh, again from my limited understanding of the law that it is clear that they did not meet their their hurdle of, of closing the deal getting a regulatory approval and and as I'm reading Jim Robo's word, uh, chairman of, uh, of Next Era, uh, we have terminated our merger agreement. So it seems to me unambiguous. Uh, and under the terms of the merger agreement, Next Era will pay Hawaiian Electric Industries a $90 million breakup fee and up to $5 million for reimbursement of expenses associated with the transaction. So they, they're not playing hardball. They're not pushing back. They're saying, we're done. Here's the check. Uh, adios. Best of luck. Yeah, that's what they're saying. That's for sure. And I think that's the mm -hmm. civilized way to go. They, I mean, it's, uh, they, I think they've been very civilized about this, but uh, they, I don't think they've been treated very well. In any event, um, uh, Mina, what do, you, what do you think about that? What do you think about this termination fee and departure, decision to uh, terminate the deal uh, and close it down right now, one day after the decision was announced? Well, I think, you know, you, you have to look at the landscape it's a perverse uh, political and regulatory environment. Do you say perverse? You know, in a no perverse, yes. Perverse, okay. Yep. And, and it, it, they're in a no-win situation. Yeah. You know, how long, how long can they do how long can they drag this out in, in well, this? Well, I, I don't think they, can, they could have been optimistic about the future. Um, I think they were probably fairly optimistic at the outset uh, 18 months ago, but as, as mm -hmm. time wore on um, and all those things happened to them, and the, uh, in my view, they were mistreated in so many ways, um, I think they became less optimistic. And at this point, sort of like Super Ferry, uh, when the um, Supreme Court said, no, you can't operate without an EIS, they said, okay, uh, and, and you can't operate, you must stop. They said, okay, we're stopping, we're out of here, goodbye. We're terminating operations and we're closing the company. And it's the same thing here. I don't think they have any confidence that they could do any better if they, t if they took further action to try to get approval. It's over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, who would want to resubmit an application with, with um, 
you know, in, in this kind of environment, I mean, there's, there's no certainty there. There's a lot of discussion and no certainty. Yeah, hostile. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, well, why, that's why I think uh, Hawaii is considered 49 out of 50. Well, and then, I mean, business. just to, to, to state uh, or to repeat something really important, which is uh, they would be required to get uh, yet again a 75% or more percent shareholder mm -hmm. approval, which uh, was kind of a squeaker vote uh, last year in terms of this uh, very lucrative deal. I mean, I, I don't think anybody can argue that $4.3 billion, that uh, there was a lowball purchase price uh, if the deal had gone through. And, and that just barely made it over the the seventy five percent shareholder approval bar, so that's 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 the heavy lift uh, in general, and uh, that's something that's uh, that's huge I think from the perspective of any Hui or other group whether they're local whether they're in California or New York or wherever they happen to be in terms of uh, getting over that bar. Anybody look at how the stocks are doing both Nextera and uh, Hawaiian Electric? Yeah, in fact, yeah, I, uh, it's... Uh, go ahead, Mina. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it closed today at, um, what, $30.10? So That's correct. The, since, the, um, since July 1st, what I calculated is since June 29th to 4 o'clock today, when the stock, stock market closed, the estimated local value destruction is about $120 million. Yeah, wow. Well, it's, and, it's, that, and, I mean, it's, and that's, that's just for the shares in Hawaii. Yeah. Well, I, I recall hearing that 75% of the, is it, am I right about this? 75% of the shares are held by Hawaii residents. The rest no, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Twenty-five percent are held by Hawaii residents, and seventy-five percent by people offshore. And whoever, you know, might have made money because of the four point three billion dollar uh, buyout mm -hmm. uh, has, has lost that possibility. I mean, I suppose you could have sold your share before this happened, uh, and um, you know, uh, you, you would have avoided the loss. But now, I think people who hold the shares are going to lose some money. Well, if you look back yeah. to uh, right before the the announcement in uh, the end of, uh, I'm just looking at the stock table right now, uh, let's say December, December, or November, 20, November 28th, 2014, so this is about a week before the announcement of the, of the acquisition, you can see the bump in the stock chart, $28.19, $28.19 before the announcement of the change of control. So they're, they're still, uh, of course, we don't know what it's going to do tomorrow, but uh, HEI stock is still uh, in a relatively uh, safe zone, and it certainly hasn't cratered like I think a number of analysts think thought it would once NextEra decided to go home. Any effect on NextEra? Oh, no, I didn't see any. Yeah, I, I looked. Uh, maybe this no. is just too small a deal for them. Well, but, um, but but what people should be aware of is the um, people's credit rating, mm. you know, and and that you know right now the triple B minus one notch above non non investment grade with a neutral outlook, you know, and you know now with the unstable regulatory environment, unfriendly business climate, um, without a strong financial part partner, you know, there's very little cushion or safety net um, for them. And, you know, all this results in, um, you know, higher costs for capital. Which means, um, which means higher rates for consumers. Exactly. Additional yeah. costs. And what you don't have right now is the option. You know, when, when we know that significant investments need to be made, and with the merger application, they were proposing um, uh, great credits to help offset bills for new um, investments. You know, now that offset is gone. Yeah. You know, so, so now you're looking at... Um, higher interest rates for access to capital, plus oil prices going up, you know, 
So rates so rates could go up, will go up. So what what about another another yeah. suitor? What about another buyer? I mean, isn't this a good opportunity for somebody come in and uh, make another proposal and uh, go down the same track? Hopefully, do better with uh, the PUC and the public. Okay, you, like, you know, in your right mind, I mean, any credible. How would any credible company come in, look at the situation in Hawaii, and and um, uh, think it would be a good idea? I mean, next there was ranked what 183 out of Fortune 500. It was the top performing utility in the nation um, this year. It's a premier renewable energy um, developer. Yeah, hard to, it's yeah, hard to, it's, uh, it's hard to believe anybody else is going to come around after what happened. Uh, and it, it's hard to believe anybody credible will come around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I and mean, then the other... You know, in, in the Star Advertiser, sorry, in the Star Advertiser, you know, it talked about this 21st century utility that was interested. You go do the background check on those guys. You know, it's a startup. It had no history. It was started yeah, up yeah. in 2015. Yeah, that's not going to work. Marco, and I'm going to yeah, on this, Marco. I'm just going to say the other side of the equation is not just having a, an eager buyer, a credible buyer, but also a willingness on the part of uh, the HEI company, the HEI board, the HECO companies to start this process all over again. I mean, I think it, it doesn't take mm -hmm. someone with a PhD in psychology to observe that there's uh, most likely quite a bit of merger fatigue in that company after the past 20 some odd months. So to what extent they're going to be ready and willing to jump back on a merry-go-round uh, with a credible, willing seller, I think, uh, is, uh, is a question. Yeah. Well, and yeah, and, and Wall Street, this, I mean, this is another example of Hawaii rejecting foreign investment, offshore investment. Um, and I, I don't think we fare very well in the eyes of Wall Street. So uh, it's, not, it's not just this deal. It's not just utilities or energy. It's uh, offshore investment. Uh, that's why we're relate, we're, that's why we rated uh, 49 out of 50 for being business friendly. So uh, what about the implications here? Um, I recall that um, Hawaiian Electric was going to take the, uh, a good part, most of the 95 million uh, and was going to apply that to developing the grid. Furthermore, it, was, it found uh, 125 million on top of that, uh, which was going to apply to developing the grid. What's all that about? How is this going to, you know, how is it going to play out with Hawaiian Electric going forward? Marco? Oh, sorry. Uh, I think, well, it remains to be seen. I mean, it's going to be uh, whatever the net will be after taxes, of course. It'll probably be somewhere, I don't know, I guess somewhere in the $60 million range. And uh, I'm sure there will be plenty of discussions uh, there at the company in terms of where to spend the money. And there will be plenty of uh, cries from the peanut gallery, various peanut galleries, in terms of it should go here, it should go there. You know, don't you dare spend it on executive compensation, all sorts of other populist red meat stuff but i mean you know 60 million is a lot of money to the common folks certainly is to me but as far as being able to do something dramatic with the heco infrastructure that's that's not going to happen so i would hope that there's going to be a careful uh dis discussion as to where they can get the most bang for these these not not so much freebie bucks but uh, certainly something of a windfall so uh, I, I hope they they spend it wisely and i and i think they will Mina, isn't there a fair chance we're going to go back to what was happening before the deal began? That is, everybody criticizing Hawaiian Electric about everything. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, that's... They're an easy, big target to pick. And, um, you know, there is a real lack of understanding of, you know, the role of the public utility. And, you know, right now, the special interest group, um, you know, present company excluded, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, really trying to promote rooftop solar as the solution. But, you know, that's, that's just one part of the total equation. And, um, you know, this is what is troubling that 
this has you can't take a linear approach here. Yeah. And and you have to have a capable, viable, technical savvy um, utility leading leading the charge right now. And, yeah, we have to empower you know, them again. We have to uh, turn our attention to them and help them. Uh, I think the Civil Beat article, uh, most of you guys must have seen it. This is actually a series of articles to describe their history and their relationship. I always thought, you know, Hawaiian Electric is Hawaii's, you know, utility. It's Hawaii's uh, electric company. And we ought, to, uh, we ought to treat it with some reverence in that regard. But, but um, you know, Marco, you, 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 know, you were a, uh, an intervener for all these 18 months. Uh, you saw a lot of things happen. And, and uh, you created the backdrop of uh, the possibility of a co-op. Uh, on yeah. Hawaii Island. Uh, how does this affect your effort to build that co-op? Well, I mean, this is uh, a day that we've been waiting for in the sense of we, we've been neither for nor against the merger, but uh, now that the reality uh, is that it's not going to move forward, uh, we will uh, continue to do what we've done in the past. We've had very cordial and friendly uh, communications with uh, the folks at Hawaiian Electric and uh, that will continue. You know, uh, one thing is, I suppose is good is we all talked about, let's get through this already, because it, you know, it was such a, a, a cloud on, on the initiative. Uh, and now it's done, uh, better or worse. Some people think better, some people think worse. It's done and we move on. But Mina, let me ask you, you know, how has this changed the environment? How has it changed the evolution of, of energy, clean energy in Hawaii, how has it changed the initiative and, and what will happen going forward? Well, I think, you know, um, you know, it, it, it will make it harder to achieve our goals because what is missing is the, the, the rap, the rapid change that could have happened, um, in the the HECO organization to uh, be more responsive, analytical, um, uh, within the organization to deal with, with these fast changes, quick movie changes. Um, so, you, you, you you could have taken a um, a model from elsewhere and help with the with the organization needed organization changes within um, Hiko dealing with proxies. So that's removed from the table, and so I think it will take us as Alan Oshima has always said. We can get there. It's going to be a slower process. Um, you know, they saw the merger as expediting it. Yeah. You know, as as we talked about earlier, you know, it, it's going to be a more expensive proposition. Yeah. You know, so with, with higher costs, so we may not be able to do everything we want as quickly as possible. Well, thank you, Mina. Thank um, you, Marco. We're out of time. Uh, we, what we need to cover is we need to cover this again soon and I'll try to schedule something with you guys again in the near future. Uh, we've only just seen these events take place. This is history in the making today, Monday, uh, the 18th, and um, we need to look at it more carefully. We need to look at the reaction all around town to see what happens. It's unfolding as we speak. Thank you so much, Mina Morita. A former chair of the PUC and Marco Mangelsdorf uh, of ProVision Solar in Hilo. It's great to get your take on all these things. We'll be back with another show shortly. That's Mina, Marco, and me. We're talking about moments of history, uh, the energy uh, industry, energy history being made today. Aloha. <laughs>